be spending our time together today. Luke chapter 6. We're continuing in our series through the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we have uh, spent 23, 24 weeks or so, all told, uh, in journeying through the Gospel of Luke, examining uh, verse by verse the life and ministry, the claims of Jesus, uh, wrestling with the reality. Is Jesus exactly who he claims to be? Did Jesus really raise from the dead? If Jesus did, in fact, raise from the dead, then that has radical implications for all of human history. And so this is a, just a powerful journey for us to go chapter by chapter, verse by verse. And so Sean kicked us off last week in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 11 verses, I believe. And so we're going to pick up in our conversation uh, there today. today. So uh, if you have it, Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. I'll read and follow along. Uh, we use uh, the Christian Standard Bible. So if you're on a device here, that might make it a little easier for you to uh, follow along. Chapter 6, starting in verse 12. It says, During those days, he went out to the mountain to pray, and he spent all night in prayer to God. When daylight came, he summoned his disciples, and he chose 12 of them, who he named apostles. Simon, who is also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. After coming down, stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples and a great number of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. Verse 18. They came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was coming out of him and healing them. At first glance, if we can just be honest with each other, at first glance, that little section of scripture doesn't seem all that overwhelming. It doesn't seem like there's a lot here to unpack. Um, that would be false, of course. We know that with scripture, there's always a tremendous amount uh, just sitting in the pages for us to unpack it. So that's what we're going to do together today, is just unpack those verses together. Uh, I think there's some really unique distinctions. So today is going to feel a little bit like seminary. Okay, there's going to be some theological terms and ideas that appear to us in this text that are really important to the foundation of our belief system. Okay, so it's going to be a little feel like seminary, like we're learning some very technical, doctrinal, theological ideas, which we're going to do today. So we're going to put our thinking caps on our listening ears, right, teachers in the room. We're going to make sure we're listening really well. And there's a spot, of course, on your connect card where you can write down some of these things. Uh, but there's also some really unique application in this text that I don't want us to miss either today. So that's what we're going to seek to do. And so the reality is, as we jump in, there's a couple things we need to keep in mind. Number one is that Jesus' ministry is growing. Now, it shouldn't come as a shock or a surprise to us that Jesus would be conducting a very faithful and fruitful ministry. But Jesus' ministry is growing. He's becoming an extremely popular preacher and teacher. And he's really good at attracting large crowds. Everybody with me so far? Right? I'm just checking on you for a few minutes to make sure we're all still together because it's going to be a lot today. So there's this reality that Jesus is really good at attracting very large crowds. He's also really good at retaining a large following. And that's what's unique about Jesus is he can draw a crowd and he can keep a crowd. And so at this point, because his ministry is growing so large, Jesus seeks to bring some organization to his ministry. So Jesus sets out to select leaders. He's bringing leaders to the team. And so the temptation for us would be to see this as reactionary. So that, well, Jesus' ministry is growing, and so he has to respond to that by somehow figuring out an organizational model that would work really well. I would argue that this is very intentional by Jesus, that he's doing this on purpose. And so selecting these leaders isn't merely about organizational management, but rather it's about preparing for the future. Everybody with me? What Jesus is about to do in front of us is a strategic move to prepare for the future, not only of his ministry, but for the fact that you and I are gathered in this room together today, Jesus intentionally planned for right here in this moment. So this is really, really neat. Jesus is about to select 12 men 
who will follow him and serve him in a brand new capacity, not seen before. And so in preparing for this major decision and for the day that's about to unfold before him, Jesus goes to pray. Look at verse 12 together. Look at verse 12. It says, During those days he went up to the mountain to pray, and he spent all night in prayer to God. And so Luke is showing us something really great about Jesus, and that Jesus spends intentional time in prayer. In fact, as we will see unfolding in Scripture, before every major event that Jesus is in the center of, what does he do beforehand? Did he, did he guess this? Say it louder. He goes to pray. This is central to the theme of who Jesus is. And so he goes and he spends time in prayer. There's a profound thought, I think, that lingers here for us today that we're going to come back to a little bit later. But I want you to hold on to that. We're going to kind of put a pin in that for just a second. Let's skip ahead and let's look at verse 13 together. It says, when daylight came, he summoned his disciples and he chose 12 of them who he also named apostles. I want you to notice, this is where we're going to get, a, a, it's going to feel a little like seminary, we're going to feel more like we're all being trained here in, in theology and doctrine. I want you to notice the distinction. There is a distinction between disciples and apostles. Everybody with me saying that? Okay, there's a distinction between disciples and apostles. Jesus has many disciples, but only selects 12 to be designated as what? Apostles. We see that later Jesus appoints 70 other of our preaching mission in Luke chapter 10. We see that, right? But, but it's important that we see that the apostles are being selected from a considerably large amount of followers. A considerably large amount of followers. He chooses 12. Now, he, this is going to be a big teaching point for us this morning. So everybody, uh, everybody can lean in and pay attention to this. So, the word disciple, we've talked about this before, we'll keep talking about this, this applies to us. It means learner, pupil, devoted follower, that's who we are. But the word apostle means something different. It means something different. So our English word apostle is a transliteration. Everybody say transliteration. That's a fun word, isn't it? That's like one of those $100 words. That's a good one, it just rolls off the tongue. Plus you can use that in family gatherings. We're like, dang, you're super smart. Transliteration. It's a real word. It's very nice. But the word apostle is a transliteration of the Greek word apostolos. Everyone say apostolos. You're thinking, why did I come to church and learn Greek today? This is really, really important, right? Original language matters. Apostolos. Apostolos is a fun Greek word. It means ambassador. It means delegate. It means messenger. And so it carries with it a sense of importance and dignity, right? A sense of character. Apostolos. But it's a transliteration of that word plus a verb, apostolo, which means to send away or to send out. And so Jesus is setting, are you with me so far? Jesus is setting apart a group of men that will be his ambassadors, who will be his delegates, who will carry a very important messenger, and the, uh, these messages and these messengers are going to be sent out. And so it is a word that is both it's both a noun and a verb all at the same time. So apostle is a very, very important word for us, even in the church today. And so these men are designated apostles because they are given a particular commission. They're delegates. They're ambassadors. They're given a task. They're given an objective. They're given what? The Great Commission. It was given first to the apostles and then, by extension, to the rest of the church when it was established. And so often the New Testament, often, now watch this, often the New Testament refers to these 12 apostles as the disciples. We see that. But there is a distinction we need to keep in mind, and here it is. That disciples are learners and followers. Apostles are disciples who have been given a particular commission. Everybody see the difference? Disciples are learners and followers. And apostles are disciples who have been given a particular commission. So this begs the question, what exactly does an apostle do? And how does that flesh out once they're given orders? How does, exactly, how does that work? How are apostles chosen? What was the criteria? Jesus had a large group to pull from. 
He settles on the desert. How does that work? So without stirring the pot too much this morning, which is one of my spiritual gifts, I don't know if that's one of yours. Pot stirring, right? Pretty good at it, right? The Lord's really holding me over the years. Uh, so without stirring the pot too much uh, this morning, the idea of apostleship, it sparks a little bit of a controversy. Now it's not a big controversy, it's not like one of the big fun ones. But it's a small controversy that we, exist, that we see existing in the modern church today. So to be clear, though, this is important. Watch this. There is no controversy with regard to apostleship in the Bible. The debate is centered around the role and office of an apostle in the modern church. Now, some of you may not have a church background and experience where you, you know someone who has the title of office of apostle. But I'm telling you right now, if you start attending a church and it's like, oh yeah, hey, this is, uh, this, is uh, this is Jason, he's our associate pastor, and here's Mike, he's the apostle of the church, you're going to go, what? That's, that doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. No one's really heard that before, but this exists in modern church in a, in a big way. So what we need to do is we have to understand what the Bible says about apostleship. Now, I don't want to get into this too much today, but from a seminary perspective, I'm going to teach you some, some doctrine and theology over the next few moments together that I think would be very helpful to you. It would be very helpful to you in grounding your understanding of Scripture. Are you with me? Say amen. you with me? Okay, we're going to journey together for the next few moments because I believe once I can, once I can flesh this out for you, what's going to happen is you're going to see there's actually no need for, for controversy. That was for you, Jackie. Controversy. That's how. How do you say it? You say controversy? That's no fun. <laughs> it does, it, it's always going to sound better when she says it. She can say anything, and it sounds infinitely better. Yes. They don't say controversy. All right, we're going to talk about that. Later. <laughs> There's no need for controversy. So there are two types. Uh, Jackie's from London, by the way. Some of you are like, why is he, conf why is, he is she an English teacher? Why is, she, why is he conferring with her? Yeah, so she's from London, so she says everything better. Um, in the Bible, you have two types of apostles. How many types? You have two types of apostles. You have a capital A apostle, right? And I practice this at home. I can't make a lowercase a. It's not very good, okay? You have capital A apostle, then you have a lowercase a apostle, right? So capital A apostles were appointed by Jesus or the other apostles and were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Get that? That's really, really important this morning. The ones we see chosen here, with the exception of one, will all become eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus. Judas Iscariot does not get that bus, okay? He does not become an eyewitness because he will claim his own life as a response to betraying Jesus. You'll find that a little later spoiler alert, okay? Now this, in fact, leaves a vacancy to the 12 apostles. There were 12, now how many are there after Judas checks out? How many? You have 11. So this creates a vacancy. And so we see in Acts chapter 1, we see the apostles, they maintain a qualification in the selection of a new apostle to fulfill that role so we get back to the magic number, okay? So in Acts chapter 1, verse 21 says this, it says, therefore from among the men, who have accompanied us during the whole time that the Lord Jesus went out and among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us. From among these, it is necessary that one become an eyewitness with us of his resurrection. So they made eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus central, central to apostleship. Look here, especially if you're skeptical. Why would you put such an emphasis on the resurrected Jesus and being an eyewitness if it's all made up? Why? Why would that be important? Why wouldn't you try to select someone who can get, hey man, here's the story we're running with. Can you get down with that? Yeah, bro. I'm in, man. Just cut me in on some of the you know, offerings. Just let me know what's up. That's not the case here at all. They made a criteria that you had to be an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus. So if we're, if we're skeptical over who Jesus is, we got to stop for a second and go, that doesn't make any sense. You made it infinitely harder now if you're trying to perpetuate it. This does, however, this is where skeptics who know the Bible, right, who can go, now hang on a second. What about Paul? Paul doesn't meet all the qualifications set by the others. 
He is, however, an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. Jesus himself appears to Paul. Where? Anybody know? The road to Damascus. In a very profound way, when we see the book of Acts, Jesus, at that moment, appoints Paul to the office of apostle. However, this creates an uphill battle for Paul that we don't have time to get into today, but he does have to appeal to the other apostles about his new founded apostleship. And in the end, Paul becomes affirmed as one of the apostles, making it a baker's dozen. So these apostles, appointed by Jesus, eyewitnesses to the resurrected Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit, are going to do, look here, this is really big, they are going to do extraordinary things while evangelizing the continents. These apostles are going to do extraordinary things that go beyond the scope of reason in the pursuit of evangelizing the continents. So, so this is why, look here, this is why the apostles were able to create a global movement in a single generation. Isn't that amazing? They created a global movement in a single generation. Think about that. Think about that. Now, you have the second type of apostle. This is the what type? Lowercase a. Everybody say lowercase a. So we have the capital A. We have the lowercase a. The lowercase a is the apostle. It's the role that I believe that we still have this role today. I would argue that this role still exists in the modern church today. See, later, Paul himself is going to teach the church in Corinth that there are very spiritual gifts. There are various spiritual gifts. And among them, listed is the gift of the office of apostle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, Paul says, And God has placed in the church, where? Where? In the church, first of all, he says, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and then, lastly, different kinds of tongues. So, the lowercase a apostle serves as a messenger. He serves as a leader, one who has authority. A good example of this, biblically, Barnabas, Silas, Timothy. Everybody with me so far? These are good examples of this. These are good examples of these types of apostles. This role and giftedness, it still exists today and can be identified and affirmed by a local congregation. Absolutely, this still exists today. So to put it simply, here, here's how we would designate these two from a very um, theological perspective. We would say apostles of Christ, capital A apostles, were the source of the church's doctrine. With me? They're the source of the church's doctrine. They, inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote the New Testament. The New Testament is where we find our church doctrine. Apostles of the church which are different, lowercase a, were its early leaders. Its early leaders. Now look, this is really cool because we, we're about to make this really make sense. As you look back throughout church history, you can see men who were given this gift and this office. You can actually see it throughout church history. Men like Tertullian, who gave us the doctrine of the Trinity, Augustine, Luther, Francis of Assisi, John Calvin, John Knox. These are all men who hold the office and role of apostle because of what they contributed to the church. Make sense? And so it's, it's with these gifts in mind that we see it apply in a modern age too, okay? So capital A, lowercase a, important distinctions that can bring clarity to our understanding of biblical roles and gifts. I believe when our lifetime has gone over and we look back upon this era of church history, we will see modern day church fathers. I'm always skeptical to start to, I'm, I'm hesitant to identify men as though they're the ones we think are modern day apostles over the church and then something happened, right? And it's like, well, scratch that guy off the list. But I think, but I think we see these men that exist today that have this role, and I think church history will affirm that for us as we get a little later. So, we see that Jesus selects his capital A apostles in verses 14 through 16, and then we come to verses 17 through 19. Let's read this together. Verses 17 through 19, it says, After coming down with him, he stood on a level place with a large crowd of his disciples, 
and a great number of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. They came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those tormented by unclean spirits were made well. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. And so now in this moment, we see another really exciting shift in Jesus' ministry. Look, please don't miss this. This is really, really big. This was no longer just a local thing, touching the Galilean region only. What Jesus is doing here has huge implications. This now, this meeting, this day, right here, this moment, it includes a great number of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon. This is why this is important. Because Judea was the southern area of, of Palestine. Jerusalem was the capital. While Tyre and Sidon were not in what was considered a traditional holy land. This area wasn't considered a traditional holy land. But on the north coast of Israel, which is in present day Lebanon. So in this crowd, Jesus was likely preaching to now both Jews and what? Say it louder. To Gentiles. Holy smokes. This is a big deal. The gospel now is going beyond the parameters of Judaism. This is a big deal. Big deal. And so these crowds, they came with two motives. Two motives. To hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Bottom line. It's really that simple. His teaching attracted them. But another powerful magnet for Jesus was his unparalleled reputation as a healer. Jesus healed. Jesus was going to be the only hope for health. This isn't an era and an age where medicine was just herbs and spices, gang. Are you with me? Herbs and spices here, oils. We're not talking about modern medicine. This, people were dying left and right of things that, I mean, you just... In a heartbeat, you're, you know, pop an antibiotic and you're maybe good to go. And so Jesus was the only hope. So if you know that you've seen this person die and this person die and this person die, and all of a sudden now you've got symptoms of that. Where's your hope? Jesus is their only hope. And so they came in droves <clears throat> to see him. Not only that, but people who were tormented by evil spirits were made well. Man, can you do me a favor? As best you can, I would, would love for you to just picture this scene in your mind. Can you imagine the, the electricity of the moment? The, the chaos that's likely there? Thousands of people all trying to touch Jesus. People dealing with illnesses and sickness, people coughing and hacking, folks dragging their lame friends and those who are blind and can't hear, people who are demon possessed. Can you imagine the crowd that's coming? What would happen if word got out that Jesus is the healer in this place? What would we do with the panic of all the types of people that would come in looking? you to imagine the chaos of the moment. Jesus has a massive crowd of people waiting on him. He has spent literally all night praying. He appoints 12 apostles for the first time. He gathers people on a hillside. He begins teaching them, and then he moves in among the crowd to heal everyone. What, the, what an incredible moment this must have been. What an incredible moment. And I think in this moment, we see a couple of really powerful points of application today. So here's where we can land this text in our lives. Number one, it's really this simple. It all begins with prayer. I'm going to push in real hard on this. I, and I'm going to be so bold to say, if you're not praying regularly, then you should not be surprised that your life reflects that reality. That you are not praying regularly. We let so many excuses and distractions get in the way of prayer. Am I, am I right? Can we just be honest about that? I'm one of those guys when we're doing group prayer. I'm, I'm all in for about 10 minutes. Yes. 
And about 15 minutes, I'm like, is that dude done? Man, but he already said all the stuff I was going to say. I don't know. I don't I wonder what's for dinner. I mean, you just, you just start, you know, then you look up and you're like, you know. And then you know the person in the group that's going to be like, they're gonna, we're going to be here in a minute. You know what I'm saying? They're praying for everybody. You know what I'm saying? All the lost people in the world are getting prayed for today. You know what I'm saying? You're like, oh my gosh, how did they get this group? I mean, just everything is going through your mind that's distracting you and keeping you from prayer. When you're at home and you're trying to pray, the dog's barking and kids are running downstairs. You're like, I need a prayer. I need a, I need a prayer fort. That's what I need. I need a prayer bunker that I can get into. And even then, we find ourselves to be distracted. But there's a reality that in this passage, we see the very first thing that Jesus does in order to begin for this particular moment is to do what? Pray. And why? It's to prepare him. He prays to prepare him for the day that he's about to have. Listen. Listen. If Jesus was that reliant on prayer for the day of end, how much more should we be dependent on prayer? If the Son of God needs prayer to prepare for the day that he's about to have, I don't know how many people you're appointing or church history you're creating or demons you're driving out or, or, or sick people you're healing on any given Tuesday. I don't know what that day looks like for you in this particular arena. But if Jesus needs prayer for that, I think we need prayer for our days even that much more. This is important. It all begins with prayer. We could, we, could, man, we could sit here all day talking about the importance of prayer. And we all know it. It all begins with prayer. Number two is that Jesus has the power to completely heal. I, I don't want you to hear me on this because I'm going I'm to stir the pot a little bit this morning. I love stirring the pot a little bit. We see Jesus healing the sick but also delivering people from evil spirits. Jesus healed the mind. Jesus healed the body, and Jesus healed the soul. And I believe, look here, listen, I believe, and I think Scripture affirms this, that Jesus is still in the business of healing people today. I do not discount the power and the miraculous presence of the Holy Spirit healing people. I welcome it, I plead for it, I beseech the Lord. There's so much that can be said about this that's already been said. But if I can, I'd like to add just a few important points to the conversation for our context today before I start getting all the emails and stuff. Um, number one is I believe Jesus can heal the mind. I think Jesus can absolutely transform our way of thinking and believing. I think Jesus can transform it. And I don't think Jesus needs to give you a week, a month, or a year so you can eventually get there. I think Jesus can do it in a moment. I think you can go from an enemy of God, a child of wrath, to a friend and a child of light. I think you can do that in a moment. I think Jesus can heal the soul. I think he can transfer people from death to life in just a moment. I think Jesus can free people from demonic forces. And I'll say it from saint. Redemption Community Church believes that the devil is still alive and well and is possessing people and influencing people today. Amen. I was hesitant to share this because we have a lot of young ears. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretty this up. I had the chance to, to visit, and I'm going to talk a little more about this a little bit. I had a chance to visit a new partner in church in Alabama this last weekend. And they're going to be a fantastic partner for us. Man, I'm so grateful. But last Sunday morning, the pastor was getting up after I preached. He was asking for prayer for a particular community. And when he did so, I mean, you could see the room. I mean, I'm telling you, you could see the room just kind of, I mean, everybody's demeanor changed. And I thought, what happened in that community that has this type of response? So the youth pastor pulled me aside and said that, <clears throat> I need you to fill in some blanks here, okay? I want to honor them that we have children. There's a student who in the middle of the night, for no reason, with zero history or any motive, got up and took the life of his siblings and his mother, <laughs> took a shower, went back to bed, got up, went to school for the day, 
went home, then left to go to the mall with his buddies when the stepdad came home from a business trip. No history, no background. You can call that whatever you want. And there's experts that can label that, and, and that's fine. But I know what I call that. That is pure and right evil. That is straight from the pit of hell. To have that level of disregard for human life. I believe the devil is alive in hell. And is actively seeking to destroy. Seeking to destroy families, people, our children. I 100% believe it. And so I think Jesus today can still free people from demonic forces. And we should pray regularly for that. That Jesus would deliver the people that we know in our lives and our community that are being used by the enemy. And lastly, I believe Jesus can heal the body. I believe Jesus can heal the body. I believe he can deliver us from addictions and habits that have us trapped. I believe that Jesus can, can free us from every single disease or illness if he so chooses to do so. Jesus can heal us from every one of our ailments, everything that plagues us. But hear me say this morning, the primary goal isn't for us to be physically healed. That's not the primary goal, so that we can live longer in our sin. The primary goal is, is to heal us from our sinful condition, so that one day we can live forever without the presence of a good King Jesus. Yes? Isn't that it? That's the primary goal, is so that we can be freed from the illness of sin to live forever with our King. And so there's a reality that you may never experience physical healing in this life. And I say that actively knowing that one of the largest areas of contention for us is when we pray for Jesus to heal someone we love, and he seemingly doesn't. And then we think Jesus doesn't love us, he doesn't hear our prayer, he doesn't care for that person. And that's just not true. Because I believe that person can still experience a full, complete healing. And here's how that's possible. One, because I believe Jesus can heal your soul. I believe through forgiveness, he can heal your soul. I think he can seal your mind, or I'm sorry, he can heal your mind by the Holy Spirit speaking truth through the Bible. I believe Jesus can heal your body, freeing you from the way that you live, even if it means healing you in your death. Death is a healing, friends. One day, we pass from this life to the next. And if we are in Christ, you will be completely healed. Completely. You will be made new, perfect, and you will live forever. And isn't that, look here, isn't that the ultimate healing? Is there a healing in this life that's better than that? No, because it just buys us. So there's healing, even in death. So let me say this to you today. I believe as we sit here in this gym, that today the Lord can heal you. Now we're not going to get weird about that. But I believe the Lord can heal you. I believe that if the Holy Spirit is stirring in your heart today, that he's working in you. And so today, you can pray. In this moment, right now, you can pray and you can confess your need for Jesus. You can place your trust in Him. And the Holy Spirit will regenerate your heart. You will be made new and you will be a son or a daughter of the Most High God. I believe that He can heal your soul right now in this moment. And I believe Jesus can heal your mind today. That you can pray and ask Jesus to fill your mind with truth. To, to quiet the words and the ideas that, that seek to keep you trapped. So many of us in here have bought into a system of lies and beliefs where we think God needs to do what we think God needs to do. You need to be freed from that today. You need to be healed from the reality that some of you bought into the lie that you are worthless, that you don't matter, and that whatever your family says is somehow more important than what God says about you. And you have bought in the line and sinker. And you are trapped. You are absolutely trapped in that garbage belief system. And you need free from it. I believe Jesus can heal your body today. And so would we be so bold to ask the Lord in a vulnerable moment to heal us from whatever ails us? Whatever sickness, disease, addiction, 
pain, whatever the problem is, that the Lord would even go so far to say, Lord, if you're not going to heal me from this, would you at least give me the strength to endure it so I can be a witness for you? So here's what we're going to do this morning. This morning we're going we're to spend some time responding to the gospel. Every week we respond to the gospel through the taking of communion by remembering Jesus' broken body and shed blood. It's Ephesians 1, 7. We talked about it earlier. We don't get forgiven. We don't get righteousness. We don't get grace without the work of God. And God has, by his shed blood, died to purchase our salvation. And so we remember that when we take communion, we are, we are participating in the gospel. And we are remembering what Jesus has done. We also respond to the gospel through the giving of our gifts and offerings. And hear me say very clearly, especially if you're a guest here today, at Redemption, we're never going to tell you how much to give. We believe that is between you and the Lord. But we will tell you that even though the Lord doesn't need your money, His people do, and the mission demands it. So if we're going to continue the work of bringing the gospel to people, then we need resources to do that. And so I'm going to tell you, I think giving is critical. I don't even go so far even if you're a guest here today, I want to invite you to participate in the blessing that it is to further ministry. But I'm never going to tell you how much to give. That's between you and the Lord. That's not my business or my concern. But when you drop, just do a smile on your face. Because it's a joy to give. And then lastly, here's how I want us to respond to the gospel today. Look here. As you stand and you go to your stations... If today you would like to have someone pray with you that the Lord might heal your soul, your mind, or your body, we have some folks that would love to pray with you today. We're not going to share your story. We're not going to put a microphone in front of you. This is not about trying to publicize your struggle. It's about saying that if there's, if there's one place in your week that we should be able to be vulnerable and get our arms and... and and love wrapped around each other, it should be this hour. It should be this hour right here. And so I want to urge you, if the Lord is stirring in you, and you want to ask for prayer, you want someone just to put an arm around you, I want to pray today that the Lord would heal your soul and bring forgiveness to you, that the Lord would heal your body, and whatever you're dealing with and struggling with, or just that he would heal your mind and take away the lies that you've been believing for so long. We have some folks that are going to be right up here in the front. So as you go to your station, if you want to come up and pray with one of us, we would love to invite you to do that. And then the band will sing, and we'll close out. So let's stand together. I'm going to pray for us as you go. Take communion when you're ready. Give your gift and offering when you're ready. Come pray if you need a church. We love you. That's why we do this. Father, move, Lord, move. Get us out of the way. Give us the strength and the courage to acknowledge the brokenness in our life is a result of sin. Move us out of our own way, God, so that today we can receive a blessing. So that today we can receive an encouraging word, a prayer, a, a word from you, God, knowing that you want to heal us completely. You want to heal our mind. You want to heal our body. You want to heal our soul. Lord, you want to bring us into the fullness of relationship with you. And that only happens when we surrender to you. So, Father, remove our pride, remove our angst, remove our anxiety, remove the things that would keep us from taking a step forward today. Jesus, we thank you for your word and the encouragement of the text. We thank you for the application of it. That it all begins with prayer. But, Jesus, you have an intentional plan for your church. That, Jesus, you heal completely. Thank you for your word today. Move among us now as we respond to you and the gospel. As we take the bread and the juice that represents your broken body and your shed blood on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. As we give our gifts and offering to encourage the commission that you've given us to advance. May you move us to prayer this morning, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Prayer partners, I'll invite you to come forward. You are dismissed to your tables.